Um, and um, we are very excited for Dr. Gita Shah and Dr. Kaushal again to do this uh, session for us. Um, Dr. Um, Shait could not join because he had a conflict um, at his work. But uh, we are very excited. I hope you guys have tons of questions to ask because we are, even though vaccinated, we still have questions. Um, the only housekeeping requirement is please post your uh, questions on the chat and we will take care of it after our doctors are done with their slides and with their topics. So um, your restart, uh, Nimesh, we are ready? Yes. Gita Ben, your slides are up. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, and good morning. Happy Saturday. So today is a ongoing session, continuation of what we talk. Um, we will be very brief. There are, I know, a lot of questions for a lot of people, but we are all learning together. This is the one condition where public and the provider physician community are learning. At the same time, but hopefully physician community is a lot ahead of the game uh, in last one year or more than a year. So I can see the slide. Uh, what happened? Are you able to see your own slide? This is COVID-19 vaccine updates by Dr. Gita Shah. Um, but I can see. Pawan Shilpaji, are you able to see it? Yeah, Nimesh, we can see it just fine. Gita, yeah, okay, we, we are okay. You may just have to change your view. Uh, I'm trying to have on my screen so I can talk. Uh, so, or maybe I should use my own slide. No, I think you can, Nimesh can manage the slides. If you can just go up to the top right and click on the view. There is nothing like view, but. Uh, anyway, I, I need to, I can see in the corner, but I cannot expand it. Do you so, see it in the corner? Yeah. yeah. Just click on it and it'll switch. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the first slide is uh, uh, just showing, uh, this is a really recent slide and it shows all over the world how this pandemic has taken over. And globally, a uh, day before yesterday, there had been uh, 155, 665, 214 confirmed cases. This is a underestimation of the confirmed cases. We, we all know that. And then there are over 3 million deaths. And, uh, but the good news is there is a, one extra thing is vaccine doses has been, as if 5th May, there is over, uh, what, what should I say? How many million has been given vaccine doses has been given, but we are so much behind still. So next slide shows, this shows that uh, so many countries started long before and look at the Israel is number one. We, United States is number fourth and more than us, other countries have given vaccine. Look at, unfortunately, our own country, India, is so much behind in vaccination. The point I'm trying to say, uh, we, the prevention is the best thing in medicine and we all need to encourage each other to take the vaccine ASAP. And that is how we are going to control this um, pandemic um, going forward. Next one. This shows the United States. So far, over 100 and almost 150 million uh, people have taken, uh, 150 million people have taken probably one dose. 
but definitely over 110 million have completed their vaccination. And then other countries, it shows how far behind they are. In a, and it is, it is not, we are not trying to um, say anything bad about anybody, but this is the reality. It involves multiple things, availability of the vaccine, and then distribution, and then um, public taking the vaccine. So next slide. Again, same, Israel is number one, and we are number fifth almost. So um, we need to still long way to go on taking the vaccine. So as I was asking uh, uh, Shilpa ji that do we have our own data and we don't, unfortunately, but I request every single person. Now uh, you are going to, we are not talking about below 16 or below 18, but that is also coming soon. Next one. This is a little older slide. This is from March 2021. This has changed. So I couldn't get the newer slide, but you can see the three vaccine, what we have in this country, Pfizer, Moderna, and j and So it is, uh, efficacy is excellent. And then there are different variants going to come out. And I know my colleague is going to talk on the variant. So we can talk about that. And more data has come out that Pfizer and Moderna might be covering almost all variant. But at what level, we can discuss at that time. We don't have AstraZeneca and other vaccines. So next one. So I have three common vac three vaccines, which is approved in USA so far. And these are emergency use authorization. I soon it will become a um, um, complete uh, approval from the FDA. So it says uh, actually Pfizer is the only one which is over 16. And as I know, my granddaughter, she's 17, she took it. So um, others are 18, so it's not much difference. And efficacy is excellent, especially the efficacy of becoming extremely sick, mainly becoming a, a on respirator or in ICU or in the, or dying that really prevents, uh, preventable by all the three vaccines. And that is the most important. I have to say that you took the vaccine or I took the vaccine, it is no 100% guarantee because um, it depends on your individual condition. Um, we gave monoclonal antibody in our hospital. And recently we had a patient and uh, that patient had completed a vaccine in February. And in April, he became corona positive and uh, um, he was very symptomatic. So he was a transplant patient. So we end up to give him the monoclonal antibody. So we do not take it granted. If you have any symptoms, if you are in contact with somebody, even you have taken vaccine, make sure you get yourself tested. So nothing in medicine is 100%. So each individual case should take on their own and then communicate with their own provider and sooner than the later, that's the name. So next one. So the one, this one um, had gotten so much um, news and uh, Johnson and Johnson vaccine was taken off and then again FDA approved for the use and this blood clot uh, mm, issue has been uh, become a, one of the big concerns, especially people who have taken the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The uh, answer to the question is that do not worry. It is really very rare. Um, it is no clear cut answer yet. And maybe um, Dr. Koshal might uh, say a word on that. But the 
point is that there is nothing in medicine which does not have side effects. Now this happens more on the more with the it look like more with the uh, women who are uh, on a birth control pill or has some kind of hereditary issue. Um, so some kind of specific population uh, may get this issue with the blood clot. All we need to be aware of, and there are no blood clot for the Pfizer and Moderna at present, and both are a mRNA, different method than the other one, which is Johnson and Johnson. Next one. I just wanted to mention, next slide, please. Uh, common uh, symptoms with that, and if one of these symptoms or multiple symptoms happen, um, you should go near as emergency room. Hopefully, this is just for the information. It is extremely rare. Otherwise, this vaccine would not have been approved again. Next one. Um, there are two other vaccines which are going to come. Uh, Oxford, AstraZeneca, uh, it will not come in this country so far. Uh, it seems to be, but it is the one, that is the one I think is in India. And the one I wanted to put the Nova Vex, um, that is the one looks like going to come if uh, the trial goes uh, as they expected. And they are trying to put um, flu and um, uh, COVID-19 together in the one shot. We have to wait and see it happens in uh, uh, fall, but uh, that is a possibility. Um, uh, I think that's all I have to say about this vaccine. But the uh, Novavax seems to be promising, and uh, it may cover more variant than what it is now. So next one. And everybody should be knowing this when you took the vaccine, what can happen. So there are, uh, these are the common side effects. And uh, it happens with uh, almost any vaccine, pain, redness, and swelling. Uh, it is nothing particular about COVID-19 vaccine. Um, however, it could be some, some of the population experience uh, uh, this side of symptoms after the second dose. So if that happens, uh, don't be alarmed. It may go away in 24 to 48 hours and just take a lot of fluid and a rest and a person should be fine. These are the common side effects. Now, there is a one allergic immediate side effect, and I don't think I have a slide for that, uh, which is anaphylaxis and patient who are carrying uh, EpiPen they should talk to their uh, uh, provider before they even consider taking uh, this vaccine. And most likely they will not get this vaccine, but it varies. So you, you're, you should follow the direction of your own doctor. Um, the anaphylactic reaction usually happens immediately. However, sometimes it could be a delay reaction with a similar symptom. So if you, most of the vaccine plays watch you for a half hour or 15 minutes, but we should take care of ourselves and watch out if any of the symptoms happen, um, go to nearest emergency room and it will be reversible. Next one. I think next one is my last slide. And uh, what I want to say is one thing. So, okay, we all took the vaccine or we will be taking vaccine and summer is coming and we are really dying to get out and do what we used to do in uh, 2019, pre-COVID time, but take steps slowly and we all need to not get surprised with variant or anything else. The good thing is because of these precautions, your allergy symptoms might be down, your upper respiratory tract infection, bronchitis, 
etc all those symptoms must be down uh, and please follow uh, all these symptoms i mean all these um, uh, behavior as long as you can avoid crowds and six feet away is a um, relative term and that was for the covid time whole time even now but um, if you are indoor with lot of people it is hard to manage that and that's where people who are not vaccinated they are going to get trouble so six feet or three feet all these numbers are thrown to us but most important thing is wear the mask most of the people now started to wear two masks um and we i'm sure there will be question about cloth mask versus surgical mask but uh, we'll talk about it wash your hands that is the most basic thing we used to do in india before eating after eating but we forget in this country so we need to continue that uh, encourage your neighbor encourage your friend family to take the vaccine but despite of that if you get the symptoms make sure you get tested for covid-19 thank you so thank you, we're going to have dr kaushal now uh, with the slides and then we are ready for q and a's after that Can you see your slides okay, Dr. Koshal? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. You're muted. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Koshal, you're muted. Uh, sorry about that. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, yes, um, for those who didn't meet me last time, I'm uh, Manu Koshal, one of the pulmonary critical care physicians up here with MedStar, and uh, being taking care of mostly the severe COVID patients. So. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Shah. It was a wonderful presentation on the on the uh, vaccine efficacy. I'll just talk about more on uh, on the new variants that are coming. I know there's a lot of questions and and a little bit about long COVID. I don't know if you've heard it. I have no financial disclosures to disclosures. Take, take it to the next slide, please. So, uh, what do we know about the variants? Um, so, you know, why variants? So, viruses are constantly mutating, especially coronavirus, and um, it's constantly mutating. There's mutations happening with every replication. So, uh, what is this mutation? Mutation is actually an error that happens when viruses are replicating. Um, and most of these errors or mutations are actually have no effect or sometimes mostly they, they can be detrimental to the to the virus. In rare cases, somehow these mutations actually give it an advantage to to uh, to be more communicable, to be more transmissible and and in some mutations can cause uh, these viruses to actually be more pathogenic or virulent. Um, generally where it happens is where there is active, more the replication of the virus, the more chances of these mutation or errors happening. So places, as you know, you know, when it was, there was a surge in, in the United Kingdom, we got the UK variant around that time. And then we see it out here in, um, uh, United States now, uh, Brazil, where we know right now before India, that was the epicenter of these things. And now of course in India, where it is going unchecked. Generally, it is happening in people in, in which the virus can, with weaker immune system in which the virus can stay in longer and keep replicating. Um, and once that variant comes out, it starts spread, spreading easier through the community. Now, you know, generally um, several variants, but how CDC and World Health Organization um, categorize these is, is first is the variant of interest. Variant of interest is something that they see is happening more often, but they don't have enough data. It doesn't mean that the virus is less deadly. It just means how much data they have. So the current Indian variant of uh, B1617 uh, is currently listed as variant of interest, which probably will change. 
the variants of concern is the next category are the are the viruses that that either are higher in transmissibility or or they can be more pathogenic or virulent and they, they're more deadlier and right now as of now <clears throat> the cdc uh, lists uh, p1 which is the brazil variant b117 which is the uk variant uh, the South African variant is 1351, and there are two California variants which are higher in transmission, and I'll talk about those, which is 427 and 429. Um, we don't have any of the third category, which is higher consequences. Hopefully, if that comes, we'll have to start the clock again and start a new vaccine. Um, hopefully, we don't get to that. Next slide, please. So this is a busy slide, but I'll, I'll walk you through, uh, through these things. Um, a little bit about uh, these variants. So the first one is the UK variant, which actually initially presented last summer uh, in UK, United Kingdom, and now is probably the most dominant strain here in the United States for sure, but maybe around the world, even in India as of now. Um, and the reason is because it's very highly transmissible. It does have slightly increased virulence or, um, or is a little bit more deadlier than the original Wuhan virus or the, the wild type that came after that. Um, for the most part, the therapeutics and the vaccine, so monoclonal antibodies, convalescent plasma, um, everything seems to be having as, effic uh, is as efficacious to it as, as was um, the previous virus. Uh, all three viruses are have shown um, efficacy with these ones. Now, the second one is the Brazil or the uh, P1 variant. We don't have enough data on the transmissibility, but we do know it is more pathogenic the, the, because of the mutation it has. Um, we know the monoclonal antibodies, uh, not all of them work. We have three monoclonal antibodies in the United States currently, and uh, uh, a single one doesn't work. You have to use a combination. The convalescent plasma has much reduced titer. The vaccines, um, for sure, we have seen the neutralizing antibody titer against the, this variant is much reduced, but that titer is enough to prevent severe disease um, or hospitalization in these patients. However, you know, the predominant one that uh, the Sinopharm is, you know, the Chinese vaccine, which we don't have any data, and I was surprised that World Health Organization actually approved it. <laughs> Um, gave it an emergency use authorization yesterday, which was very surprising because the data, is just, there's just no data on the Chinese farm. We know that Chile was, Chile was actually one of the top countries in South America, Latin America, where they were using this vaccine. And their, their vaccine is probably one of the best um, in that region, but they, they're, uh, they're under the surge right now. Uh, and we think it's because of the variant, which is escaping the Chinese vaccine. Uh, the other one, the, the biggest one that we worried about until a few months ago was, uh, a few weeks ago, was South African variant, the 1351. Uh, we know it, it is highly transmissible. We know it is, um, it, it, uh, the, it can escape a lot of therapeutics, including monoclonal antibodies, convalescent plasma. The vaccines, uh, for the most part, again, have <laughs> reduced, um, uh, reduced efficacy. So the neutralizing antibody in, in, uh, in Moderna and Pfizer was, was more than like it was reduced by one half compared to a normal variant but again this was enough tighter to prevent against severe and um, severe and um, severe disease hospitalization and death so so to prevent that it was still efficacious all these vaccines it may not prevent against mild or moderate disease however because it's less efficacy AstraZeneca however um, may not work I know the data is not out there South Africa actually uh, stopped using AstraZeneca and it's giving away its doses. J&J um, uh, &J also has reduced efficacy because during the trial itself, when it was it was South Africa, there, the efficacy out there was reduced to 60% as compared to 77% here in the United States where the UK variant was there. The California variant is, is something that we've known since uh, last, uh, some found around, around November, December of 2021. We know it is, um, it is more transmissible. Uh, it may not be very um, more deadlier or more pathogenic, but um, slight reduction in uh, therapeutics, but the vaccines are definitely, um, all these vaccines are working against it. Now, the big question is this India variant, which there, there are studies going on, we don't know, but um, I mean, just looking at the picture, it, it, it just sounds like it is, and based on the mutations, it for sure is way more transmissible. It has to be more pathogenic and deadlier. 
and it, it, it does have what is called an escape mutation, and I'll talk about it in a minute, uh, which, which, which helps it escape most of the antibodies and the therapeutics that we use, including the antibodies that are, you know, the, mem the immune system that's generated by the vaccine. There was a, you know, preprint um, that was, that came out out of India um, in a co-vaccine as the vaccine that is being made in India. It's not the AstraZeneca one, but uh, they say it is effective in preventing severe and, and, uh, and, um, and hospitalization um, and efficacy is pretty decent is, is what the papers say. Of course, it's not peer reviewed. We don't know what the data is because generally as, as a physician, as a scientist, I, I wanna look at the numbers and say, okay, yeah, this does make sense. Um, just talking to my colleagues in India on the ground, it seems, you know, for the most part, people have gotten one shot only, but those people who's gotten two shot they are have been protected against uh, against the current COVID surge for the most part. They have not seen in the hospitalization. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a picture. This was uh, uh, back in April, about a month ago. You can see how the vari variants change. Back in June, we had uh, we had the wild type, um, uh, the 1596. That was the second that came out after Wuhan. And as time goes by, B one one seven, the UK variant became the most dominant uh, one out here. We see some P one out here as well, which is the Brazil variant and South African variant. Now, back in February, is when the first cases of India variant uh, were um, were were detected in California as well as in the United Kingdom, actually. And um, it is present throughout. I just don't have the data how how widespread it is as of now. This was the last data I could dig up, uh, but but I'm sure the India variant is 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 here along with South African and um, a UK variant. Next slide, please. Um, and now you know the, the big question about this India variant, which which you hear about, is what is the double mutation? It actually that that virus actually has more mutation, it has about 13 mutations in it, and seven of which are at the spike protein. The spike protein is where it attaches to the cell, and also spike protein is the area where most of the uh, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies work, where we use all our therapeutics and vaccines to generate antibodies. That's the area that we are targeting. So seven of those mutations are actually happening at the spike protein, but but the two important mutations that, are, um, that, that, that we worry about, and that's why we say, it has a double mutation is because none of the variants that we have so far have these two variants. And these are the two, two mutations that we think make a virus either more transmissible or make a virus um, more virulent or more pathogenic or deadlier, in other words. So uh, 484, is, 484 is the one that, that, that is called as the escape mutation because it helps, that mutation it helps the virus escape most of the therapeutics that we're using, like the monoclonal antibodies. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but you know, initially, um, FDA, uh, FDA had approved two different monoclonal antibodies from uh, Regeneron and Eli Lilly. And then as the South African and P1 became a little more dominant and they realized that you know, the Eli Lilly single monoclonal does not work against it, they actually had to take it off and the new authorization actually says that you have to use a combination. You cannot use a single antibody. And, and the second one is going to be uh, the 542, which is found in the California, which makes it more transmissible. So, so none of these viral variants have both of these mutations. And the India uh, variant is, is peculiar because it has both. Uh, next slide, please. I have three more, four more minutes. So. Um, it, you know, the big question is, is it causing, in my opinion, yes, I think it is. Uh, I mean, I know it is the dominant strain in Maharashtra. Uh, I mean, the situation is so sad. Um, it, it, we knew about this variant back in December is when it was first detected. And, and two months later, of course, in February, there were warning signs that it is, you know, there is a surge coming in. And of course, now with, with, with not paying attention and not, not uh, no preventions, Director, director, director. Uh, yeah, so, so anyways, I mean, we had the same situation. So this was a city in Brazil, and this is what I'm talking about back in um, December. 
they had about seven, they were, they were supposed to have herd immunity because 70% of the population had been tested positive with natural immunity. They had been infected. But within that period of three months where we think we are protected from natural immunity, they had an immense surge towards, uh, towards the end of January and February. They had a massive surge of these viruses. And then they realized it was because it was the new variant. And the new variant is actually able to is, is, is overcome the natural immunity. And I think that is the case in India. I think there was a widespread infection back in India. I mean, of course, the numbers were underreported, but but I think people who were infected previously are now getting reinfected with this new variant, which is much more deadlier. Um, and, and of course, uh, this, the only data that we have is that you know the serum of the vaccinated people has twofold less ability to fight against the neutralizing antibody titer is two times less, like it's almost half. Uh, next slide, please. Um, should we be worried about, as of here, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J has remained effective for the most variant. Uh, I cannot say anything about the India variant. We know um, they will protect you against the UK variant uh, 100% for severe, even moderate disease. But, uh, uh, you know, the biggest concern for us until, like I said, a few weeks ago was the South African variant because it was escaping a lot of these vaccines, a lot of therapeutics, but the India variant in the coming few weeks and months will be, will be the problem. We don't know the data. But what I can, I can assure you is going to be that this, these vaccines will still protect you against severe disease. Severe disease is a disease that requires you to be in a hospital on oxygen, in an ICU on a ventilator or from, or from dying. Uh, they may not prevent you from having a mild disease or asymptomatic disease. Moderna and Pfizer have been actually very, um, have been invested really well in, in preventing even you know, asymptomatic uh, transmission in Israel. Like they, they, they cut down the transmission significantly. And we are seeing that in the United States, people who are vaccinated, our transmission levels have gone up uh, because because even the mild disease is not there. Um, and uh, like I said, there are studies which probably will take a couple of weeks. I know they're doing in vitro studies. Uh, we probably will have data shortly. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest worry is um, if you're vaccinated, if you're unvaccinated, you don't take precautions, you could become an asymptomatic carrier or you may have mild disease. But the problem is that you can, you can transmit this virus to an unvaccinated person and that person may have a poor outcome. As we're learning, younger, younger people are dying in India from this new variant. So, so you yourself are protected for the most part. You're not very, very unlikely that you will, you will have some poor outcome from this thing. But, but the problem is that you will carry this virus and you can give it to others who may not have the same outcome. Next slide, please. Um, uh, this is just uh, this is the data that was out there. Um, I think about a week back. This is just a data on all the vaccines, the breakthrough infections with current vaccines. So, out of uh, 95 million people that were vaccinated, fully vaccinated, and and this is just a fully vaccinated, not the 150 million doses that have been given. There have been about 9,000. Um, 9,000 breakthrough infections, um, about 132 deaths, out of which. Um, not all of those deaths are from COVID itself. Uh, part of them, you know, people will die at 95 million people, but um, only certain deaths were related to COVID. The emphasis I wanted to say here was, um, you know, people, not, not everybody mounts, in, mounts um, the same immune response to a vaccine. And people who have underlying conditions or are on immunosuppressive therapies or have immune disorders, are the people, these are the people that will, they, they may still get, um, they may still get a severe form of this infection or may even very rarely die. Out of 95 million people out, by the way, I mean, just 100 deaths, that, that's just remarkable compared to what we were seeing with the virus. So we, I have personally taken care of some of these patients who've had breakthrough infections. And most of these patients, uh, like Dr. Shah said, uh, there was an organ transplant. We had two organ transplant patients who had who had uh, the vaccine shots, um, uh, they ended up, you know, generally the recommendations for those people is two months. Is that's what they think that you will have enough immune system to protect yourself. But these people, um, you know, uh, went outside, took off the precautions earlier. One of them was within three weeks. The other one was within a month. They ended up in my, in my ICU, but fortunately both of them made. Uh, there was a patient with uh, cancer 
uh, who just had gotten immunotherapy, just got vaccinated within three weeks, got, got the COVID. Fortunately, she, even she did not. I mean, this is a typical patient that would have never made it. So vaccine did help them. Um, so breakthrough infections that are happening in people with immune suppressive. So if you're on immunosuppressive therapies for autoimmune conditions or cancer, or if you're organ transplant patients, these are the patients who, who, will, who, who are susceptible. So recommendations are, if you, if you get a vaccine and if you have these conditions, two months is your period, not two weeks. Generally, we, for regular people, it's about two weeks amount that uh, immune is on. Uh, next, please. Um, just a brief a couple of uh, slides on uh, long COVID. I know I'm over time, but I'll take two minutes. And uh, this is a new thing that we're learning as, 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 as we're seeing more and more. Uh, it's not only the, the acute issues that we are dealing with, we're actually, so, so a certain set of patients are actually having symptoms even six, seven, eight months out. And we are seeing these patients. I mean, they're going by different names, post, uh, uh, post COVID syndrome, post acute COVID sequelae long haulers, long COVID. Uh, generally symptoms, they can get better and four to six weeks later, they come back again and they haunt the patients for forever. Um, next slide, please. Symptoms, um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so symptoms generally, most commonly shortness of breath, people are generally weak. There's a brain fog, confusion, memory loss, uh, hair loss, there's a rash, there's arthritis. Uh, people have uh, come up to me with a loss of sense of smell and taste three, four months out. They're still not able to test that. Um, heart rate palpitations, uh, there have been cases where this has caused uh, uh, heart rate to go up in younger individuals. Um, coughing is there, joint pain, um, very rarely fevers, uh, a lot of depression. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, and this was a slide from the nature that they're kind of you, you can see how, how every organ system is, is being affected with these, including kidneys, blood vessels, joints, uh, muscles, lungs, heart. Lungs and heart, of course, are the predominant ones, but every other organ, uh, you, we, are, we are learning as we are going. It's an evolving field as we are going through. Next slide, please. Um, you know, what to know if you were infected or if anyone, uh, you know, friend or family was, was ever infected and, and they're suffering through this illness it's good to know because this may be long COVID what they're suffering for. Uh, who gets this? We don't know. It can be anybody. Anybody who even had mild disease, who got better within a few days at home, did not acquire to the hospital. A lot of people that came into the ICU and hospital, I've spoken with them, they've gotten better, they've gotten symptoms. A lot of those patients, majority of those are the patients who were in the hospital uh, that, that get long COVID, but even uh, younger patients. And the two theories are, uh, that there is a prolonged low amount of virus circulating in the body causing this thing, or, or the other theory is that your immune system remains hyperactive even when the virus is gone. Next slide, please. So what you want to know and want to tell people that, that, that you're aware of, family and friends, you know, knowing is, is the biggest thing. If you know it, um, you, wanna, you want them to be addressed. So you want to send them to a physician and the physician can appropriately send them to a specialist where, where, where some things can be done. I mean, there are certain things that we can reverse and prevent it from getting worse. There are a lot of things that we just don't have any idea, but at least we can keep a close eye on that. Next slide, please. This was against the recommendations from Nature, from the, uh, uh, nature Medicine, you know, how, how every organ, how a specialist, and this is what we are, we are in the middle of, um, forming a, a post-COVID team right now in every system. MedStar has a long COVID referral base, and uh, this is what we're doing, collaborating with a, a nephrologist, a, a kidney specialist, a heart specialist, a lung specialist, and forming a team and, find, and identifying these patients and see who and what, what we all can do for these patients. Next, uh, and that, I think that's the last slide. Thank you, and we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, we have some questions on the chat. Mina, if you want to start referring to them. And thank you to Dr. Shah and Dr. Kaushal for a very helpful uh, session today. Um, Mina, we are ready for you. Okay, uh, let me just turn my video on. Um, hey, thank you very much, Dr. Shah and Dr. Kaushal for the, um, uh, the, the presentation. So these are some of the questions that came up. One question is, what metric would you use to keep us 
like when could we stop using masks and keeping distant? Like what would need to be happen for us to be able to do that? <laughs> I guess uh, we both can take this question, but answer is we are not yet ready to remove the mask or all the precautions. We do not want to get surprised. I know mask is very uncomfortable, uh, and uh, but I guess it is the most, it has saved lives. Mm -hmm. And not only COVID, but other things. So even CDC says, or our governor says, or somebody says, think about yourself, your family. Don't jump into and remove. You can, if you are walking on the beach alone uh, with your family, you don't have to wear mask, I guess. Common sense tells me. But I would say if I'm <clears throat> going to go to temple, I'm going to go to hospital, our hospital will not allow anybody without mask. And you know, all the stores everywhere, yet people are not ready. I think it took us a long time to get them used to masks. We don't need to jump and remove the mask ASAP. There is no time limit. Even Dr. Fauci keeps on changing his answer. So please protect yourself. Don't hurry. You know, we let everybody experiment. We want to be safe. And that's my answer. Yeah, I mean, I'll say it's the same thing. You know, we, we don't know what these variants are gonna do. We don't know if they're gonna escape, especially the India variant and the South African variant are the two that are most concerned. We don't know what is gonna happen with these um, if, if you're vaccinated, if you catch one of these. Uh, now, um, the other aspect is metrics. Metrics generally what you wanna look at is how the community spread is, how, how bad it is. It, it, it's still spreading around the United States. I mean, not enough, there's no, not enough immunity. Uh, like I mentioned, I think you probably may be okay from the virus, but you may carry it and spread around and give it to the people who are unvaccinated. So, so you know, vac vaccines will, uh, sorry, the masks will be around uh, through this year for the most part. And it's, it's just a good practice, it's safe practice. Um, my other question, um, which I'm sure a lot of the members on our panel uh, or on our, uh, who are participating will want to know. So I'm vaccinated. Um, and um, it, even though India is going through a surge right now, but after they've gone through their surge, what would I need to do to be able to safely go back to visit India or should I go back to India? Because their vaccination rates are pretty low right now and it's because of just sheer number of people there. So what would your suggestion be in terms of traveling to India now that I'm vaccinated? Um, you know, in my, in my opinion, you know, this is, this is probably the worst time, not only because, because of the risk of infection, but more importantly, you know, the health structure and everything. And, and, you bring this no, I'm, back. Yeah, I mean, like, suppose, like, I'm talking like maybe in August, like, like we passed so, a really difficult phase in India. They, so, you know, their infection so, rates are going down. Yeah. So I think the biggest, biggest, uh, I mean, you know, we'll get guidelines from, uh, from, uh, from FDA, you know, how, when it is safe to dare. And most likely what, what we're looking for is against the transmission of virus within India, how the surge will settle down, which probably will take at least, you know, two months for things to settle down and the transmission to go on. The vaccine rates will probably take a couple of six to eight months for, for India to go behind. So it'll be safe to travel when the tra when the virus is just not everywhere. You're just not breathing every. The transmission rate uh, within areas or especially states that you're going to is very, very low. Um, that would be one of the metrics that you wanna use. Of course, when you go there, you know, masking and, and, you know, the same thing that we've been doing for the last one year, you know, that'll be, that'll be the key. Uh, right now, of course, it's just unsafe for, for the next, and I would guess at least for the next, I don't anticipate for the next two, three months, things changing drastically. Uh, I like to say, I, I absolutely agree with you, um, Dr. Kaushal. I, I would say I'm talking about my age and, you know, older age who love to go in winter months to India for four months and then come back and all that. Let's hold up, stay here and not jump on. I don't think this year we should plan at all unless it is emergency. 
that you have to go, the medical system is overwhelmed and it's not going to get fixed in the next two, three months, in my view, because million people. And what I hear, every other house has a COVID positive. That means people are not yet vaccinated and it's, it's really a very sad situation. So let's uh, not plan to go to India as long as we can, unless it is some, uh, by the way, I think there was one, uh, uh, one on WhatsApp or somewhere I read this doctor, ID doctor from New Jersey, who had taken the COVID vaccine here, both the doses, and after a while, one of the family member was sick. He went to India. In fact, he died there. So you know, there are cases, and you know, personally, our own condition. One Im immunity as we get older, our immunity theoretically goes down, and practically too. So give a break this year, stay home, take care of yourself, wear the mask all the time when you go out, and only person who can protect you, you is yourself and God, that's all. So another question that we have on the chat is that, what are your thoughts on herd immunity? Um, I'm gonna assume in the US and is it obtainable? And then there's a second, question is that uh, when will it be relatively safe to go on vacation within the U.S., um, balancing um, safety and then the need that we've been staying at home for so long? Uh, I'll briefly answer the herd immunity. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, the numbers keep varying is because of these variants that we're getting and we don't know what the actual number is going to be. You know, 70 percent, 80 percent, even 85 percent is what they're thinking. Um, Herd immunity probably will be very, very difficult in our country because, you know, because of the, the vaccine um, uh, hesitancy and, and which is so, so prominent. Of course, it's getting better over time, but, um, but with new variants coming in and, and this is, it'll be very, very, very difficult. Yes, we probably may reach that point towards the fall of this, this year. I have a feeling that enough people will be infected and enough people will be vaccinated that we may get to a point where we have herd immunity. Of course, hopefully we don't get a variant that escapes all of these things and then we start all over again. Uh, as for traveling within the US, I think it's fairly safe enough to travel. You do want to know where you are going, how the situation is, because there, there is a surge, there is positive rate in, um, in, in states like Mississippi, Idaho, and even Florida, it's a little higher. So you just want to be cautious about it. Um, but if you're vaccinated, you, you still have to wear the mask, keep the distance. Um, avoid, uh, you know, indoor spaces. Uh, I think it's safe enough to travel within the U.S. Um, Dr. Shah, do you have, you know, your thoughts? I I agree with you. Unless you drive and go to the local beach uh, on a non-busy time and go pro protect yourself, that's all. Nobody is going to tell us when it is going to be safe. If somebody does say, that means they are not aware of what's coming next. And we don't want to be surprised and get one of the variant which is not covered or uh, partially covered by the vaccine. Vaccine is not the 100% answer. We have to do everything together. But vaccine makes, as uh, Dr. Koshal says, it prevents the hospitalization, hopefully, but more so the admission to ICU and death, that is the most important for vaccine, but it doesn't prevent my case or this or that. So um, wherever you go, do your homework and don't take it granted that 4th of July, as some of the politicians are saying, we should be all ready to enjoy, go on the mall and uh, enjoy fireworks, no. Answer is no. Um, another question on the chat is: While in the U.S., um, should we, we should we be wearing masks indoors while in large crowds, even if we're fully vaccinated? 
Uh, now the answer is yes. I mean, if you if you actually go to the CDC website, there's a very nice picture with vaccinated people, unvaccinated, and activities. And then uh, the vaccinated people have certain things that without masks that you can do, and certain things where they recommend. And it's very nicely done because you know there's a green zone, there's a yellow zone, and there's a red zone. So we don't go into the red zone if you're unvaccinated ever, but people with who are unvaccinated are mostly in the yellow and uh, and, and red zone. So yes, if you're indoors um, uh, in large crowds, you can control the ventilation. You can keep six to, uh, you have to wear masks. Even outdoors, actually, if you're with people that you don't know of the vaccination status and you can keep the distance and it's going to be, you know, uh, concerts or large gatherings outdoors too, you should be wearing masks. Because again, you know, you could bring it over and transmit and give it to somebody who was unvaccinated. That's a very decent possibility. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, let's see. You did answer the question about the nasal spray, the nasal vaccine. Oh, no, there's a question. I'm sorry. Um, in some of the cases of the vaccines, um, I've heard that muscle pain and arthritis can be triggered. Um, so what are your thoughts about that particular issue? You know, I don't have, I mean, I was looking at, at the various data, the, which is the vaccine long effect. I mean, it's one of the data that releases out. With Moderna and and, um, and Pfizer, I have not seen lingering effects uh, in, for the most part, they have not reported those. Uh, I am, I don't know anything. I know with J&J, &J, the, the issue is with, uh, like with, the, with the blood clotting, which generally is happening in a women a childbearing age, but I don't know if uh, muscle pain, I don't know if Dr. Shah knows anything. Um, and uh, I would say same thing, but, uh, when we get uh, local inflammation and arthralgia more than the arthritis, if you get a fever, some patient ex experience that, but those are temporary self-limited symptoms. No chronic symptoms ha has been identified when I was doing the research. And uh, no, those are some patients, I, some, uh, some of the colleagues in the hospital where I work said that they had to take two, three days off because they felt kind of weak and because of the fever and myalgia and arthralgia. But no, answer is no, no long standing effect. Um, oh, there was two questions. I think Dr. Koshal, you answered one of them. It's is it overkill to get the um, COVID testing every two weeks if you're an essential worker. Yeah, I mean, unless unless you're traveling, meeting somebody who's vulnerable, non-vaccinated, or if you have symptoms yourself, mm -hmm. um, that'd be the only time. But just because you're an essential worker in the line of, you know, I'm a critical care physician, I've been tested maybe twice throughout all of this. Okay. Um, and what about uh, the vaccinations for um, for kids? I know that Pfizer is um, the Pfizer vaccine is being. Um, uh, it's being considered by FDA for 12 to 15. Anything younger, uh, two to 12? Do you know anything about that? Um, yes, uh, both in fact, uh, one follows other or both simultaneously. 12 to 15 uh, emergency use will be coming out soon. I, I guess by next month. And then they are talking about uh, two months to 12 years, 11 years that will be the next. So the Pfizer medicine uh, is, and Moderna both, they are already doing the studies on this uh, younger population. So it's a question of time uh, to make sure they are okay as far as side effects are concerned, but question of time, everybody will be included. In, in fact, the, the one, the babies from six months to onward. So it will become like a flu vaccine eventually. It may take by the end of the year at the most, but soon um, I was listening yesterday, Pfizer CEO was in fact saying openly that any variant, new variant comes, we need a hundred days to add that in our vaccine now. How true it's going to be, time will tell. But he was saying even that. 
uh, so Pfizer and Moderna both seems to be very promising. And uh, Johnson & Johnson has also used in certain population uh, where some patients do not want to take two dose or whatever. So all, and it's convenient to give Johnson & Johnson in the doctor's office or uh, locally in emergency room, wherever. So um, all the three vaccines are very important. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, would it be safe to wear a cloth mask or the surgical mask? Um, any, any recommendations? Um, so Dr. Kaushal can say what uh, his experience or his thoughts, but I personally believe two surgical masks I had been wearing, of course I'm older than you guys, but uh, two surgical masks all the time, I go to a Harris Theater or I go to a hospital. Um, one thing about surgical mask, it makes me sneeze more, in fact, allergy kind of, but you throw away and wear new one. I don't know how many people wash their cloth mask and all this feet in the cloth, it's more infectious to themselves than others. And I'm against cloth mask. I have no cloth mask with me. Only thing I believe is surgical mask, very disposable. You can change, depending on use, you can change or reuse whatever is. And, um, but I don't need to be fancy and match my clothes with my mask. So I'm, I'm above all that. My goal is to protect myself. And that's about it. And that should be the goal for everybody, yeah. in fact. So that's my answer. Yeah, no, it's, it's the same thing. I don't think uh, there is much of a difference. Of course, if you're using a cloth mask, you want to make sure it has a double layer, not a single layer. You know, thickness should be good and uh, breathability should be there, but, you know, thickness needs to be good. Uh, surgical masks, of course, are easier. You can use and throw it away. And like Dr. Shah said, I don't, I don't think a lot of people wash their masks uh, the, the way it should be done after you know, a couple of uses. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to look fancy, what I do is wear a surgical mask and then a cloth <laughs> mask over it. So. Well, thank you so much. This was really very informative. I'm sure we will have more sessions as such. Thank you again, Dr. Shah, Dr. Kaushal, for always thank you. informing us and keeping us on track, you know. So um, now we will, um, if nobody has any questions, we are going to move on to our next webinar, which is uh, with um, NIH All of Us program. And I'm going to have Dr. Pavan Javeri take over now. Good day, Jananda, everybody. And uh, thank you again to um, Dr. Koshal and Dr. Shah for such a very informative presentation about um, the status of COVID-19 as it continues to ravage us. Um, I'm going to start out with a simple poll. So for those of you that can access your device easily, uh, there's three short questions that are up there. And if you could answer them, yes or no, uh, you should all be seeing the questions right now. And um, if you could just answer those three quick questions, we have about uh, 39 people on the call right now. If we get to maybe half or so in the next 20 to 30 seconds, uh, we will go ahead and share those results to get you a sense of what's going on and where we're gonna take this talk. So we have a brief but power, uh, information packed session coming up um, and uh, love to have your input and um, we'll keep it open for another five seconds. If you guys wanna put your votes in and then I will share those results to get you a sense of where our community is at and it will tee up Dr. Prabhudas to really share about what we have to talk about. So thank you to all of those that voted and you will see here I believe all of you can see this, that uh, about half the folks have heard about the All of Us Research Program, but half have not. Um, the term precision medicine is much less common and about two thirds of the folks have not heard of precision medicine. So we'll get a little insight into that. 
And then towards the bottom, you can see as far as the likelihoodness of uh, participating in research uh, at 48% likely, another 20% very likely. So well over half the folks are very likely or likely. And hopefully through the course of this presentation, we'll move some of those very unlikely and unlikely towards the likely, very likely. Um, and so with that, I am going to share a brief video to get you guys um, geared up for what's coming up. This is only one minute long. We are one nation, one people. When called upon to give from within, we come together and find that our capacity to help others is limitless. What lies inside all of us is more than data. It's life. It's more than insight and medical research. It's vision and honor and compassion. What's flowing through America's veins is its diversity. The next great breakthrough will be found in each and every one of us. And what we find there will unlock mysteries, heal the sick, and eradicate disease. We ask for one million individuals to come forward and stand on this landmark in history. All of us are different, and it's those very differences that will lead to answers for generations to come. Sorry, one. 